welcome, welcome back to another edition of the Football Forever podcast, a podcast where we talk about the Liga MX and everything going on around Mexican football. Man, the theme for this weekend's action was red. Yes, week four in the Liga MX had plenty of red cards. I don't know what, I mean, I, 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 how many did they hand out? Like, I, I could think of at least four. I know the America versus Monterrey match had one. Then the Toluca versus Tigres match had two. Pizarro and Aquino both got sent off. And then the Cruz Azul and Cholos match had one red card with Pablo Aguilar. So, I mean, plenty of red cards, plenty of, of drama in, in this weekend's action in the Liga MX. But let's go over the topics for today's podcast. How about that weekend? How about the weekend for the Mexicans in Europe? At least for some of them. Some of them had, had a good weekend. Others, yeah, not so much. We're also going to dive into the Chivas crisis, man. What is going on at Chivas? They lose again to Santos. We'll dive into that. We'll talk about the America versus Monterrey match. Tijuana versus Cruz Azul. We'll also cover that. And the Tigres versus Toluca, as well as all of week four's results in the Liga MX. And then at the end, I'll let you know which games I'm looking forward to the most for week five. So let's dive right into it. The weekend that the Mexicans abroad had, the Mexicans in Europe had, was good. At least for some of them. Raul Jimenez scoring in his debut, in his Premier League debut with Wolverhampton. He had a huge chance, man. In that match earlier, before he scored his goal, he had a huge chance. Uh, He was through on goal, but he... Just couldn't beat the goalkeeper. Come on, Raul. You got to put that one away, man. Come on now. You would have truly been the hero of the match if you would have finished that one. But um, no, regardless, nonetheless, he gets an important goal. It, it should, let's hope, it helps his confidence and it, and it keeps him in the starting lineup. But yeah, the final score in that match would be a 2-2 two two draw with a 10-man Everton team. Another guy that scored... You already know, baby. El Chucky Lozano, he's back to scoring ways with PSV in their 4-0 victory over Utrecht. Utrecht? I'm not really sure on how to pronounce it. I apologize if you if you're a, a Dutch league fan. But yeah, man, Chucky scores the third goal in the 77th minute of that game. And another one of our guys who scored was Tecatito Corona. He scores in Porto's win over Chavez. He scored the fourth goal in the 71st minute. Porto would win that match 5-0. If I'm not mistaken, Hector Herrera played the entire match. He also had the captain's armband. So Hector Herrera staying put at FC Porto where he holds an important role. Now to cover some of the guys that didn't really have a great weekend in Europe. Chicharito coming off the bench but really couldn't do much to help West Ham in their loss to Liverpool 4-0. Yeah, they just got completely outplayed. Liverpool is is in another level, man. Marco Fabian and Salcedo also couldn't do much to help their team against Bayern. As Bayern defeats Eintracht Frankfurt 5-0 and crown themselves the German Super Cup champions. And in a game that didn't happen this past weekend, it happened yesterday. Memo Choa's standard liege loses to Ajax in the second leg of the Champions League qualifier 3-0. On aggregate, they lost 5-2. So standard liege unfortunately won't be seeing any Champions League action this year. So speaking about Memo Choa, okay, we got the Champions League qualifiers out of the way. What's going to happen? What's going to happen with Memo Choa and his move to Napoli? Is the transfer going to happen? Is it not? I'm hoping. I'm hoping that both teams came to an agreement to transfer Memo Choa. But they were just waiting for Memo to, to complete these two qualifying matches with Standard Liege before announcing anything. That's what I'm hoping for because... The news of this transfer has been quiet. It's been quiet for like a week. We haven't heard really, really any new developments. Last we heard, Standard Liege had rejected a loan offer from Napoli um, because Memo and Standard Liege both don't want a loan deal. They're not interested in that. So we'll see. What I'm hoping for is that they came to an agreement and they were just waiting to get these these two matches versus Ajax out of the way to see if, if they could qualify to the Champions League, which would mean... I think an earning of $8 million for the team that qualifies, uh, that would be important for Standard Liege. 
let's see if there are any new further developments now that these two games are out of the way. So, okay guys, it's time. Let's move on to our next topic. Ah, Chivas. Let's talk about Chivas, man. And the Chivas crisis, if you can call it that. Chivas loses at home to Santos with a score of 2-1. to one. And Chivas has not won at home in God knows how long. One win in 19 league matches at home for Chivas. In this tournament, just one point out of 12 possible. Chivas is, is, is definitely not looking good. And, and, and part of the fan base, part of the Chivas fan base has it all wrong. They have it all wrong. I said part because a good amount of the Chivas fan base knows who's, who's to blame for this and knows who's at fault. They get it. But there is, I, I, I guess you would say, a small portion of the Chivas fan base that is, that is confused. And, and that they still, they still buy into this whole trying harder and willing yourself to win and they they blame the players for not showing enough character and not wanting to win enough and and it i don't know man i don't understand why what people don't get about this things aren't like that anymore sure in football and in life attitude and mentality are important but there's more to football than just playing with huevos. There really is. There's a lot more into football, especially in today's world. There's a lot more to it. It's not just about trying hard and do and feeling the colors and, and, and playing with huevos. There's a lot more uh, preparation that's necessary and careful planning and proper investment from the administration to, to aid and to support the, the players and the coaching staff. It's not just about feeling the colors and wanting to win for the club. This isn't the players' fault, man. The Chivas crisis isn't, and the the bad results that the team is having this season isn't the players' fault. It's not Cardoso's fault. Cardoso just got here. It's 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 the people above them, the Chivas administration and their circus that has dragged this team down to their level. I mean, what did we expect? You sell the team's best players off and you don't bring the necessary talent to cover these absences. Of course, the team is going to suffer. I mean, Tom Marshall said it best last night in the, in the, or the night before in the Mexican soccer show, man. He said it perfectly. Football is not rocket science. Teams that invest big money into players tend to do better. I mean, Tigres is a perfect example of this. Probably the best example of this. But America too. America hasn't missed a Liguilla in, in I don't know how long. And, and they, they make important investments into players. Royer Martinez was, was a very expensive investment. And sure, he just got to Club America. He, he scored two goals so far. And we'll see if the, the investment ends up paying off. But the investment is there from Club America. Monterrey is another example, another good example. You know, I, I understand Monterrey hasn't won any trophies recently, but they're a constant protagonist of the league. In the Liga MX, those teams who sell their best players, who sell their talent off, and don't invest in replenishing and replacing that talent, typically don't do well. I mean, aside from Santos, you know, could you think of another team that constantly sells their best players and doesn't really feel it? Because Santos is is, is something else, man. Santos has sold their best players, you know, throughout the years. They just got, you know, they they sold Chucho Benitez to America. They sold Darwin Quintero. They sold Marchesin. They sold, I mean, countless examples of Santos selling their best players and and they they managed to, to stay afloat because... Their scouting is is you know the best. I, I think it's it's good. It, we could say that. That's fair to say. Santos is scouting. They they constantly bring in talent that replaces those figures that they sell off. But Chivas doesn't have the luxury of of playing by the same rules that the other clubs do. Like Santos, Santos sells off one of their figures. They could bring someone else from Argentina, from Brazil, from Ecuador, from Colombia, whatever. Chivas. 
you know, they can only play with Mexican players. So if they sell Pizarro, you know, who are you going to bring? Are you going to bring in Elias Hernandez? That's going to cost you a fortune. And Chivas currently isn't isn't a put in a position to, to make that kind of investment. I mean, Paco de Anda, who is now back in ESPN, uh, he's the former Chivas sporting director. He confirmed the club sold Pizarro to to alleviate some of the financial stress on the club that they sold him to Monterrey for seventeen million dollars. It's insane. Uh, Cota, you know, he was way too expensive in their opinion. And they decided he wasn't worth the investment. And, you know, they let him go back to Leon. And uh, Alanis, this this was just a completely mishandled case by by everyone, including Alme- Almeida, for sure. Uh, and, you know, Amaury Vergara, he was on Football Picante recently. He confirmed that they just handled the Alanis case, the Osvaldo Alanis case, completely wrong and... Um, they, they wanted to, to convince the player to come back, to, to make things right with the player. But uh, Osvaldo Lanis, you know, he, he, does, he doesn't want to come back to Mexico. Especially, and probably not, not, not to Chivas, not after the way he was treated. Mistreated. So, this Chivas crisis, yeah man, you can only really blame it on, on one group of people. And that's the people that are running the team. The, the people that take care of the investment and the planning and, and uh, the resources and all that, man. The, the administration, Mauri Vergara, Jorge Vergara. You have, uh, obviously, Jose Luis Higuera, who is probably the most hated uh, man for the Chivas fan base right now. They're the ones to blame, for sure. So from the Chivas crisis, let's go ahead and segue onto the brighter side of the league. And let's talk about the best teams in the league so far after four weeks of action. And let's see who I think are, are the top contenders after these four weeks. So before week four, we could probably say that Pumas, Cruz Azul, Monterrey, America Tigres were the best five teams. Maybe you could throw one or two more teams into that mix, into that bag. But after week four, we could say that Cruz Azul, America, and Pumas, we can narrow it down to those three and consider them the best teams of the season so far. Now, it's still very early. You know, a lot could happen. Cruz Azul could fall apart. America could fall apart. Pumas could fall apart. Uh, it's still very early. It's only four weeks of action. But I think these three teams have the been been the best uh, so far in the Liga MX. Cruz Azul is unbeaten. Pumas is unbeaten. So both these teams have 10 out of 12 possible points. America lost to Necaxa in the first week. But then after that, they've been destroying teams. They've been scoring a ton of goals uh, up there with Pumas. I think Pumas only has has one more goal than America or something like that. And Cruz Azul has just been amazing defensively. Only one goal against Cruz Azul, and it was a very controversial goal. So these three teams, uh, Pumas and America, are showing interesting, very, very interesting things offensively. Cruz Azul showing a, a solid, solid, the best defense of the season so far. So let's dive into the America versus Monterrey match. This match was the match that I was looking forward to the most for this weekend because both of these teams were going to get tested like they hadn't been tested before in the season. Monterrey was unbeaten. They no longer are. America defeats them 3-0. America was at home in a horrible Estadio Azteca pitch. It's tragic, man. It's tragic what has happened to the Estadio Azteca going from the best field, the best grass in the league to probably, yeah, we could say that, the worst in the league. It was, It is absolutely terrible. But, I, and it, oh man, the rain doesn't help, but it's also the timing of when they installed the new grass. It's horrible. Anyway, I don't want to talk about the grass. Let's jump into the game. So America controlled... The pace of the match um, and had the better opportunities early on. They take the lead with a nice goal from Royer Martinez. And then a red card for Stefan Medina. Monterrey, after the red card, actually looked better, man. They had their best chances to score after this red card, which was which was strange. But they, they honestly took control of the remainder of the first half after they had one less less man. It was it was weird, but that, that really only lasted for the remainder of the first half. America completely dominated Monterrey in the second half. Goals from Bruno Valdez and Andres Ibarguen sealed a 3-0 victory for, for Club America. But America honestly could have scored at, at least five. 
Now, Diego Lainez, he was in the lineup once again. Miguel Herrera gave him his confidence after his fantastic performance in Pachuca, scoring two goals. But he had a quiet night against against Monterrey. He he had a quiet night himself, but you know other players really stepped up. People were asking for more from players like Ibarguen. Ibarguen delivered. He had a goal. It did come from a penalty, but I think he had a very very solid game. So Diego Lainez, you know, kind of took the back seat a little bit and other players took the spotlight you had Ibarra coming off the bench he came in looked very good and I don't know man something tells me that Miguel Herrera might bench Linus for the next match because he started Linus in the cup match versus Veracruz last night so America has a ton of competition going on internally the roster is very very strong and like I said competition is hot within the club right now you have you have a battle, I'm pretty sure in every practice, Ibarguen versus Cecilio Dominguez. Lainez versus Ibarra. You have Edson Alvarez versus Emmanuel Aguilera. You have competition in a ton of different spots. And this competition is healthy and is good for Club America. Miguel Herrera should definitely welcome this. Players fighting for the starting position. And this this is only making the club better man it, it, this is why america is looking strong and is definitely a contender to win the league this season so that is it for the america versus monterrey match now let's discuss the tijuana versus cruz azul match a tough test for la máquina cruz azul was left with 10 men since the 21st minute with a red card to pablo aguilar but the team still looked very good defensively, very solid defensively, even after their best defender, and in my opinion, the best defender in the league, was sent off. So good stuff from Cruz Azul on that aspect. But Tijuana insisted and insisted. Eventually, they end up scoring on a very, very controversial goal that sparked a ton of debate on whether the ball actually crossed the line or not. Now, here's my opinion on it. And after looking at the play for like a thousand times from 80 different angles i think the ball crossed the line i think it was a goal now this is me and i'm still not 100 percent sure i'm like 85 percent sure maybe so i doubt the ref is actually was actually 100 percent sure and positive that the ball crossed the line when he awarded the goal and doesn't the rule say that when in doubt you should just let the play run I, I don't know. I had to look at it a thousand times from tons of different angles. The ref doesn't have that benefit. And he war- he awarded the goal right off the bat. So, I I don't know, man. I, I think it was a goal, but I'm not 100% sure. And this is after a thousand replays from 80 angles. Remember that. So, anyway, regardless. Epic save. Epic save on that play from Jesus Corona. Even though it was awarded a goal, he looked very, very good on actually... Com- not of actually getting to that ball i don't know i know it was awarded a goal so it sounds kind of weird that i'm saying epic save but it was it was an epic save from chuy corona even though it was counted as a goal so anyways man yeah later the match w- would continue uh, there was drama there was shoving there was pushing because cruz azul was was absolutely upset and pissed off that they actually awarded that a goal but cruz azul does not give up man they kept trying they kept pushing with 10 men with a phantom goal and Cruz Azul ends up tying the match in dramatic fashion in the final minutes with a goal by Jerry Flores in my opinion justice was served man Cruz Azul did not deserve to lose the match man with 10 men they had the better opportunities and this Cruz Azul team is showing us their newfound DNA Players are a thousand percent bought into the Pelais and Caixinha project, and the results are showing. They're there. 10 points out of 12 possible, one goal against, and it was a very, very controversial goal. If it was if the ref says that, that wasn't a goal, then Kurasur would have no goals against them. I mean, that's that's insane. They are amazing on defense. And who are these new fullbacks for La Máquina? Who is this Jerry F- Flores player? And who is Adrián Aldrete? I mean, they're playing at another level. They're unrecognizable. Obviously, I know who they are, but they, I'm, I'm just saying they, they're playing at another level, and uh, it's it's hard to recognize them because they they weren't like this last season or last season or the seasons before that. So one goal against 
La Máquina in four matches. That is that is very good. They're the best defense in the league. And, and you know, this team doesn't score a ton of goals. They're not like Pumas. They're, they're not like America on that aspect, but they are effective. This Cruz Azul team is good, man. It's early, but this team looks for real. They're going to be a contender. They'll be in the league, yeah. And who's stopping them right there? So now let's discuss our next match, and this is Tigres versus Toluca. Tigres losing the record of 29 consecutive league, ma- league matches at home in their home stadium without a loss. This game, the first 15 minutes, were completely controlled by Tigres. Gignac ends up scoring a header from a great cross by Jurgen Damm. And then Pizarro gets sent off in the 21st minute for an elbow. And honestly, looking at the replay, it shouldn't have been a red. Huge, huge exaggeration by Quick Mendoza, but the ref buys it. It was a terribly refereed match, by the way. Absolutely terrible. But... Yeah, it definitely shouldn't have been a red card for Guido Pizarro. And this this ended up uh, hurting Tigres in the long run. But even after the red card, at least for the remainder of the first half, Tigres still looked better than, than Toluca. But early into the second half, uh, Triverio ends up tying it for, for Toluca. And then 10 minutes after that, in the second half, William Da Silva ends up scoring the second goal. Um, later, Javier Aquino would also, would also see a red card. So two straight losses for Tigres, but... Honestly, they're going to be all right. Tigres is going to be okay. Those that follow the Liga MX closely know that Tigres eventually kicks into gear. And they always do it late in the season. They, they, they arrive. They just know when to do it. They, they arrive to the Liguilla in proper form. And once they're there, once they're in the playoffs, no one wants to face this Tigres team. Because they have a ton of stars. They have the best coach in the league. So, so yes, two straight losses for, for the Tigres. For Tigres. But, they you know, we shouldn't be worried. They're going to be okay. At least, you know, history tells us this. Recent history tells us this. They, they tend to start slow and then they, they kick into gear. Tigres will be all right, man. All right, man. Let's go over the remainder of the results for this weekend's action in the Liga MX. Puebla losing at home to Veracruz 2-1. Monarcas Morelia and Necaxa put on a great show on Friday night. Morelia takes the victory 2-1. Lobos Buap and Atlas in an uneventful, kind of boring, 0-0 draw. León destroying Gallos Blancos del Querétaro 4-0. Tigres, as we said, as we discussed, losing to Toluca at home 2-1. América defeating Monterrey 3-0. Pumas, 0-0 draw versus Pachuca. Pumas still unbeaten with 10 points out of 12 possible. Chivas losing 2-1 with Santos at home. And as we discussed, Cholos drawing with Cruz Azul 1-1. So that concludes all of the results for week 4 in the Liga MX. Now let me tell you which games I'm looking forward to the most this upcoming weekend. Cruz Azul versus León is one of them, man. This game is played on Saturday night, and Cruz Azul's unbeaten season is on the line. They're coming off of the epic draw versus Cholos de Tijuana, but a León team that will come in with confidence after their 4-0 victory over Querétaro. This one will be good. Another one is the Monterrey versus Pumas match, also on Saturday night. This one is a little bit later. It's at 9 o'clock p.m. Central. A Monterrey team that will look to strike back after losing to America 3-0. They do not want to lose at home. And Pumas, their unbeaten season is on the line, just like Cruz Azul. So this this makes it interesting. Pumas has not really been tested against a a great team, a, a stacked team like Monterrey. So this one will definitely be fun to watch. And the final one is the Santos versus Tigres match on Sunday. This one is interesting because... Is Tigres really going to lose three in a row? They're on the road against a Santos team who has won their last two matches. But Santos is going through a little bit of an internal crisis. They, they lost their head coach due to, you know, different uh, factors outside of the football pitch. They had, they had disciplinary problems and, and there was a fight between the, the, the manager and a player. And, you know, Santos is going through a lot. But... With that said, they were they still managed to beat Chivas, so this one will definitely be interesting. Santos has won their last two matches. Tigres has lost their last two matches. 
this one will be good. So anyway, thank you guys for listening. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Let me know if you have any feedback, any questions in the comments down below. And I'll catch you guys on the next one. Football Forever out.